and welcome back, dear students! Did you get the answers correctly from Session 1's quick pretest on the soil transmitted helminths, our paligsahang parasitiko? These are the answers. If you got them all correct, then congratulations! If not, it's okay. Keep trying. We are now at Lecture 2, a continuation of the roundworm family of parasites in a summary of the tissue and blood nematodes as well. In believing the mantra, love your own, we must mention the capillaria which was first discovered in the coastlines of Ilocos and La Union. It is not to be snubbed as it presents somewhat similarly to a famous helminth species that we've discussed in first lecture. Why? Because of its capacity for auto-infection and intra-intestinal reproduction. Hence, you should practice caution when eating sushi or raw fish from areas where sewage is directly discarded into bodies of water or the river latrines. Once ingested by a human, it causes significant, continuous dehydrating diarrhea to the point that the patients have acidosis, shock, and even cardiac failure. For chronic infections, patients suffer from undernutrition and anemia. Identification of the characteristics ova of the capillaria in the feces will clinch the diagnosis. The immediate treatment is to address the dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and hypotension, as well as adequate nutrition and administration of the antiparasitic mebendazole. Take note that the mebendazole here is given for a prolonged duration of treatment, about 20 days. Level 5B, complete. Capillaria infections can be treated with long durations of mebendazole and prevented by avoidance of ingestion of raw fish and promotion of proper sewage and health sanitation practices. Next, we move on to the blood and tissue nematodes. Take a look at the social media news. This vagrant German tourist in Manila and the historical image of isolated tribes in Africa. Don't they both depict a particular illness? This seems to have transcended time. Their usual symptoms are strange and pique interest. We know that this, in fact, are the symptoms of filariasis, especially the elephantiasis or the enlarged scrotum. It is caused by several species depending on geographic location, but manifests similarly. Wuchereria bancrofti is the most common, accounting for 90% of lymphatic filariasis in the African, Asian, and Latin American countries. In the Philippines, the prevalence is still 3% and seen in many areas in the Bicol, Visayas, and Mindanao regions as well as Palawan. Filariasis is more common in adult males. Rarely we can find this in children, especially teenagers. Like dengue, malaria, and Japanese encephalitis, it is transmitted by the dreaded mosquito species. For Rutcheraria bancrofti, Culex, Aedes, and Anopheles are the culprits. A mosquito sucks the microfilaria in the blood of an infected individual, undergoing several stages before it is transmitted to the next human with another bite. In the human circulation, they will grow into adults, obstructing afferent lymphatics acutely or chronically. In the acute stage, the symptoms may be transient or even asymptomatic, but repeat attacks in teens and adults, 
lead to what is popularly known as elephant chassis. Filarial worms can also cause pulmonary symptoms appearing as miliary densities on x-ray. It is the gradual thickening of skin due to many repeat infections and over time, usually at the second or third decade of life, that elephantiasis, hydrocele, epididymitis, chyluria, and orchitis occur. These pictures show lymphangitis and later, over time, our patients will suffer from enlarged extremities, scrotum, or even breasts, and here it is now called elephantiasis. The diagnosis of filariasis is by finding their microfilaria in the blood at a golden period. Extraction is usually done between 8 p.m. and 2 to 4 a.m., where there is the most maximal yield. This is treated with formalin and studied under a light microscope. If they were not seen in blood, biopsy of some tissue or the use of ultrasound or serology will probably reveal the organisms. Treatment is through the administration of diethyl carbamazine. From here on, we will call it DEC, but this is associated with the so-called Mazotti reaction, a drug-related adverse reaction that includes fever, intense pruritus, generalized body pains, hypertension, and even death if there is a huge microfilarial load. So anticipate that in severe infections, you may need to give this at a tapered, gradually increasing dosage scheme for 14 days. The higher the load of microfilaria, the more toxic your patient will become during treatment. So address this by monitoring your patient closely and administering antihistamines or corticosteroids. Surgical excision of the subcutaneous nodules may be necessary, especially for those who have cosmetic concerns regarding their enlarged lower extremities in elephantiasis. Preventive deworming, health education, and eradication of mosquitoes are the key elements for the global elimination targeted to be this year, 2020. Are we there yet? Nope, I don't think so. November is considered National Filariasis Month in the Philippines. So if you have traveled in the Visayas or Mindanao or Palawan areas, you will see that in addition to albendazole, children two years and above are actually treated also with DEC. This is a preventive deworming technique done for an annual schedule for five years to prevent filariasis in these said communities. Specific methods like fogging, Biologic methods like infusing ponds and open bodies of water with carnivorous fish that eat the eggs and larvae of mosquitoes have been implemented. Ovicidal and larvicidal traps and many other methods of controlling and keeping away mosquitoes have already been in place. Unfortunately and sadly, there are still many people around the world who are affected by and will be infected with filariasis in the near future. So let us heighten our methods of vector control and encourage prophylactic deworming in order to eliminate filarial worms from the Philippine and world population as per our 2020 objective. The drug of choice again is the DEC. In the next section, we will be discussing other tissue nematodes. Are these organisms familiar to you? First off, river blindness. It is caused by the organism Onchocerca volvulus, very common in West Africa. It is considered the second leading infectious cause of blindness in the entire world. Do you still remember the life cycle? the black fly or simulium that breed in streams where humans in Africa frequent for washing and drinking and bathing by the host. The larvae are transmitted and they grow into adults into the subcutaneous tissue. And their children 
or progeny, the microfilaria, are released into the bloodstream. There are specific subcutaneous locations that are preferred by adult worms, such as the scapulae, the iliac crest, buttocks, or calves. Whereas, the microfilaria are found elsewhere, often in the eyes, where they die and cause punctate keratitis, corneal panus formation, chorioretinitis, and eventually blindness. And so, diagnosis by observing the cornea by slit lamp examination in order to find these classic presentations. Taking snips of the nodules, we can see grossly the adult worms. If these are immersed in saline and observed after a few hours, microscopic examination will reveal those microfilaria. Remember, typically, usually, the microfilaria are actually found in the cornea or anterior chambers of the eye. This is its gross appearance. Doesn't it remind you of angel hair pasta or sotanghon? I'm getting hungry. Are you? In Africa, onchocerciasis is treated with ivermectin. Remember that it only clears the microfilaria and not the adults. Aside from that, the effect is often transient. Supplemental treatment every three to six months is usually necessary. Prevention has been proven effective at most times by avoidance of the bite of the black fly as well as deworming with ivermectin in mass distribution programs. If the onchocerca microfilaria causes river blindness, it should not be confused with loiasis. The loa loa or eyeworm adult are typically seen in descriptive images as one that is extracted from the conjunctiva of the eye. The other classic finding is calabar swellings or fugitive swellings characterized as enlarged and erythematous subcutaneous tissue found around the wrist or knee joints. This time, it is another biting kind of fly, the chrysops, that transmits the larvae of the loa loa. These are transmitted into the circulation and lodged in subcutaneous tissues. So see, there is a similarity still with onchocerciasis and loiasis. They love subcutaneous tissues. The urinal collection of blood that is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. will reveal the microfilaria in loiasis patients. Adult worms are usually surgically excised when possible and diethylcarbamazine administered for the eradication of microfilaremia. This is an illustration of the manual extraction of the adults from the eye. Alternative antiparasitic treatment and supportive modalities are available for loiasis. Prevention is done by advising river residents to avoid bites from the biting fly. Travelers or foreigners are encouraged to take in DEC once weekly during the time that they are in high-risk areas for dracunculiasis eradication. In the year 2019, WHO recorded a total number of 54 cases, and these are isolated in only a handful of certain African countries. As of these moments, it is fast becoming an endangered species. Dracunculus larvae are in copods that reside in water. If the human host drinks that contaminated water, adults develop in the intestines, and the females migrate to and puncture the surface of the skin, where they produce intense pruritus and lay larvae in the water, hence repeating the cycle. The appearance of the worm, intense pruritus, and identification of larvae from discharge fluid clinches the diagnosis. 
it is necessary to remove the worm manually, often taking days or weeks. It might be useful to give metronidazole and other medications to control infection and pruritus. The solution for the prevention of the spread of dracunculiasis is quite simple. Provide safe drinking water. So far, we've discussed three tissue nematodes. What generalization can we draw from this discussion? Well, that drug treatment will only kill microfilaria at most, and adults are mechanically extracted. There are actually a lot of pet-derived parasitic infections, so we should be careful in our history thinking to always ask for social and environmental history, especially of animal exposure and level of pet care. We should note the dog and cat-derived toxocariasis, as we have seen actual cases of this in our practice. This is another example where the human is only an incidental host. The sexual cycle is produced in the animal host and incidental infection lodges the larvae in adventitious sites in tissues. Specifically, in the liver, heart, lungs, brain, and muscle in the visceral larva migrants and the eyes in the ocular larva migrants. In these sites, they induce severe local reaction and granulation. The visceral version is more common in younger children, whereas the ocular version is common in older children. Diagnosis is often clinical, but for confirmation, either an EIA for Toxocara antibodies or a biopsy can be done. Clinical manifestations of toxocariasis are often bothersome rather than medically and clinically significant. Therapy is often not advised, especially if the symptoms are mild. However, albendazole can be tried for treatment. For ocular toxocariasis, this treatment is extended. In cases of heart and CNS involvement, it is often necessary to give oral steroids like prednisone because of the intense inflammatory reaction. Hence, it is very important for us caregivers and first-line medical attendants to emphasize the importance of hand washing after playing with pets and the proper pet care, which includes, and most important, is the proper disposal of cat and dog feces as well as the regular deworming. Level 7. Toxocariasis is usually treated conservatively, but in cases of VLM or OLM, where internal organs are already involved, a trial of antihelmintics can be done as well as supportive medications. Proper pet care and regular deworming of our pets is of utmost importance. Trichinellosis or trichinosis, both terms are correct. In its awesome spiraling glory as insisted larval forms, this is one that we can fondly remember from our parasitology practicals classes. From ingesting raw or improperly cooked pork with encysted larva, they are degraded by digestive juices and the adults grow out into the intestines. They produce intestinal symptoms and the so-called classic symptoms of trichinellosis. The adults are viviparous. They can lay larvae and these are passed either into the stool or access the bloodstream and six striated muscle for residence and coil many times to form the classic spirals that we see. Diagnosis of trichinellosis is by serology or a positive muscle biopsy together with the presence of at least one classical symptom. 
Hence, meat inspection guidelines, adequate cooking, and freezing are effective to kill off the organisms. Albendazole is the drug of choice for the GI phase of the trichinellosis. However, this will not treat the larvae that are embedded and coiled in the muscles. There may be some use for corticosteroid administration. Level 8 complete. Trichinella can be treated with albendazole only in its GI phase and the prevention modalities are avoidance of eating raw meat, saying no to feeding our pigs with scraps, and meat inspection with proper processing and storage. Well, that ends this section. A wise man once said, Do not eat where you poop and do not kiss those who eat poop. Bye for now and see you on Packet 3 Lecture Series coming up soon.